Christy, why don't you start by telling us what it is about Fantascus that you like and how you got into geckos and Fantascus uh, specifically? So I started out with geckos, um, gosh, I guess about 12 years ago. I got into it kind of randomly. I went to a, an expo and ended up talking to, with one of the vendors for almost two hours. I felt a little bad about monopolizing his table <laughs> space. But I learned a lot about the geckos that he had with him and he ended up offering me a job. Really? Yes. So that was really exciting. Um, ended up traveling all over Had the East Coast. Have you been Coast. keeping reptiles at this point? No, I was interested so in them. So complete newbie. Complete never newbie. Never kept a reptile and you're nope. offered a job. I was offered a job. I don't know what he saw, but he decided that I was willing to learn. So he brought me on and I never regretted it. So, I learned so much. So what geckos uh, brought you to that table in the first place? Crested geckos, okay, one of the most sure. common species in the yep. hobby. And but, a great species. Oh, they're fantastic. They really are. They're a lot of fun to keep and a fairly simple care animal mm -hmm. and you can handle them, play with them, do stuff with them and mm -hmm. they caught my eye. So. Mm -hmm. So let's focus a little bit on Europlatus specifically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful genus. Uh, yes. Plenty of beautiful animals. What uh, what species are you currently keeping? So I'm currently keeping Fantasticus as well as uh, Fimbriatus, Guntheri, and I do have some Fiera in there, okay. uh, Peach Monty. So, so a real variety of animals. Yeah, I really like keeping a variety. I find something interesting about all of them. So it's N not to mention a size variety. I mean, huge size variety. Yeah, Fimbriatus. I've yeah. seen Fimbriatus in Madagascar, and they're literally yes. this big. Yeah, uh, my largest is a female, and she's she's a, a good about a foot long. She's amazing. Wow. So they're I could come really up with cool. a million questions to ask you about <laughs> Fimbriatus, but we're we're gonna stay on topic here with Fantasticus. So okay, so you you uh, you went to the show. You mm -hmm. approached this gentleman. Uh, Crested geckos is what brought you there. But <laughs> how long did it take you before you learned about Europlatus and got into Europlatus? So within the first year of working for him, oh, no I kidding. saw my first Sicoré sure. and fell in love with them. Thought they were just absolutely amazing. So I had my first pair within a year of getting involved in geckos. Mm -hmm. uh, I successfully produced those right out of the gate, which. I had no idea at the time, but apparently was somewhat of a feat. I would <laughs> with, say so. So you, you got eggs animals. out of those two. I did. Wild I successfully produced those, okay. had some really amazing babies. And then I got looking more into the genus and discovered Fantasticus. And yeah. as soon as you see a picture of Fantasticus, it's pretty much over from there. Yeah, <laughs> I would agree. Yep. They're such a unique and beautiful animal. There's nothing else like them out there. Mm -hmm. And I was immediately drawn to them. Uh, I got my first pair that were wild caught, and unfortunately my temperatures were not quite right for them. So too high, I'm assuming? <laughs> yes, they were too high, and unfortunately I just did not do well with my first pair, and I lost them both. And they were wild caught. I didn't know enough about them. Uh, it was one of those this was things like I summer, regretted. This was like a summer accident. Yeah, I was, living, I was living in an apartment at the time. Yeah. Uh, top floor, old building, terrible yeah. air conditioning. Yes. So. And now one day the power goes out or the air conditioning it. fails when it comes to sensitive species like this. Yes. Unfortunately, it's not uncommon. That's and, all it takes. Yeah, and hopefully, hopefully when we uh, speak about husbandry later, we can touch on that and about just how yeah. critical temperature is to this, uh, to this genus. Yeah, absolutely. It's yeah. a very, very important part of keeping them, so. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so you, you started with uh, with Sikori mm -hmm. and uh, quickly gravitated to Fantasca. So why don't you tell us about your first Fantasca pair, or did you get more than two? <laughs> <laughs> so the first pair, unfortunately, that I lost, um, that was just a single pair. Mm -hmm. But then I moved into a house not too long after that, had a basement and <laughs> much more temperature appropriate setup for them. Yes. And that's when I really dove in. And when I say dove in, I went off the deep end. <laughs> I started with one pair, but that lasted for, I think, two weeks before yeah. I had three more pairs come in, so. What year was this? Oh, had to have been about seven years ago. Okay, so at this point, Madagascar was, uh, was still bringing in Fantascus and other Europlatus, correct? Yes. Okay, yes. so so wild caught is uh, is somewhat available. Would yeah. you at that time did you uh, find many breeders? Very few, very few. It was very challenging to find captive bred animals at mm -hmm. that point, and most of mine were wild caught. Okay, um, I only knew of one captive bred breeder mm -hmm. that I would see at the Chicago show, and, and he was, would actually be selling offspring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he would, but so he, he was, was the only one well I knew enough. of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, even today, uh, to find a breeder that's willing to let go of offspring 
is pretty hard. <laughs> it is a challenge. It's yeah. a very big challenge. And often when they do let them go, they're pretty picky about where they end up because as they should so be. much work goes into them. And and I'll have to say just from from my experience with Fantasticus, um, a, as you brought up, I mean one mistake and you can lose an animal. And yeah. they do not give you. Some animals will show you that they're stressed or that they're sick. And with Fantasticus, I, I gotta say. I've seen no indication that an animal is going to die ever. Same. Ever. That's yeah. it's very rare you see anything wrong with them before yeah. you lose them. You just come in and it mm -hmm. is literally a deceased animal and it's a tragic, and it's heartbreaking, heartbreaking experience. Heartbreaking. It is absolutely heartbreaking. It never stops being heartbreaking no matter how long you work with them. Yeah. Yeah. So. so why don't we take the time to transition into the husbandry of Fantasticus? Um, it's uh, it, the good thing about Fantasticus is that husbandry is not necessarily difficult, but I, I would say that we would probably both agree that it is, while not difficult, it's you specific. Do, you do not stray from it. Yes, yes, it's very specific. Yeah. Once you have everything set up properly, really, it, it's not complicated to keep them. It's just making sure you have everything in the parameters that are essential for their survival yes. and well-being. Yeah, and that you're able to consistently provide those. Yes. It, you know, one weekend away in an air conditioning malfunctioning, or yes. you have a guest that is mean, you know, at your house, and they're like, well, they probably don't want me to turn the AC on while I go to dinner, and they turn it off. That's it. That's all it takes. That's, that's it. That's really all it takes. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. We've got to do the separate. I want to make sure we do separate videos, not just transitioning to husbandry. Okay. Uh, well, so, so what awesome. we can do, no, because we'll stop it there. Yeah. And then I'll yeah. do another intro, and then you'll that, splice that, that into. Yeah, it needs to be, and then, well, it ruins the flow of the conversation. No, no, it, it. So just ask the same question again. It's fine. Uh, so it, ask. It needs to be a hard we have to close. Yeah. We have three six minute videos. So yep. we have to close the last segment. Is what we missed. Yeah. Okay. So the best way to close it at this point, from a perspective of a guest, is to literally just ask another follow-up question. Yeah. Because we, kind of we can always put a picture of something over it, and then I'll ask the next question. Yeah. So just ask as like a just so close to a yeah, close. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. We'll okay. I got. It. Okay. I'm waiting for. I, I need that. <laughs> close. So Christy, at this point, you've got your Fantasticus. Uh, what's your collection up to right now? I try not to count because that way when my husband asks me, I can't tell him. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I would guess I probably have about 40, 40 that are adult breeding animals uh -huh. and then numerous offspring of, from Of them. all your animals or no, Fantasticus that's, that's alone? No, just Fantasticus. Oh my um, gosh. Overall, I have around, I would say about 200 animals right now. Um, it, it's amazing. It, it varies it, greatly depending on the sea time of season. It, it does. It yep. does. And it seems like a large number number of animals. But when you've been keeping uh, for as long as we have, it uh, it, it stops seeming like as much. Yeah, you get there pretty <laughs> quick. And like you said, you might be. There are certainly times of the year where you're well over those numbers. Yes, summertime being a high end one. You know, yes. less shows, no shipping. Absolutely. I wanted to thank you for having this chat, and we will resume next time with a discussion about the husbandry of Fantasticus. Thanks, guys. I appreciate you watching the video, and don't forget to like and subscribe. Check us out on Instagram and Facebook as well under leap.habitats. Take care. Hey guys, Tim Marks here from Leap Habitats. Welcome to another episode of Leap Learning. Today we are uh, joined again by Christy Canerium of Christy's Reptile Room, and we're going to focus on the husbandry of the satanic leaf-tailed gecko, Europlatus fantasticus. Yesterday we talked about how you became so enamored by this species, yeah. and uh, and we we mentioned briefly just how many of them you actually have. <laughs> uh, why don't we talk now about how you are able to provide for those organisms and what what the requirements of husbandry for a Fantasticus gecko actually is. Sure, there's so many things that go into it. It's, it really is a huge topic. But the most important thing for me is I do a lot of bioactive enclosures, which Absolutely. I really strongly highly recommend, mm -hmm. especially for this species. The more natural environment you can give them, the better off they're gonna be. Uh, we talked a little bit about temperatures, how important temperatures are. Mm -hmm. 
temperature ranges are especially important for them. They don't like heat at all. They, they don't thrive in it. So when we say heat, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from one person's perspective, keeping bearded dragons, that's 110 degrees potentially under right. the basking light. Um, so what, what number are we talking about? What do we want to keep it under? I typically keep my gecko room under 75 degrees. Um, okay. The individual cages do have UVB lighting on them that okay. warm them slightly, but not a great deal. Okay. So at nighttime, they do appreciate a very nice night drop. I take mine down to about 68 degrees. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is seasonal as well. Wintertime temperatures are going to be significantly lower. Yeah. I, my peak, daytime peak and nighttime low. Yes. Okay, so that corresponds with the way we're doing things in our LEAP laboratory. Um, we're keeping our room at about 75 degrees uh, peak, peak heat during the summer, um, about 70 degrees during the winter, during the day. And then nighttime we're dropping to about 67 or so at 60, yeah, about 67 or so at night, 68 and down to 62 during the winter. Yeah, that's very, very close to what I'm doing. I do take mine a little cool in the winter, but part of that is because some of the other species in the gecko room also like colder winter they temperatures. And, and the Fantasticus can handle it. Well, so. and it's critical. I brought this up with other species, but we believe strongly based on our experience that cooling an animal down during the winter is absolutely essential to their long-term survival, reproductive health, and individual health. Yes, I agree completely, and for so, all of the reasons you stated. They need a cool down period. You have females who, even if you aren't breeding them, they're gonna lay eggs yes. throughout the breeding season. Yeah. So without that cooling period, they never get a break. And you start dealing with issues like calcium crashes, which can be very quickly detrimental for this species. Okay, okay. Um, well, while we're on the topic of calcium, what's your supplementation schedule? What supplements do you like to use? So. I actually recently switched to the Pangea calcium, which I actually oh, no really kidding. like. Okay. I actually really like it. It's very, very fine and adheres really, really well to the feeders. So I really like that. Does that supplement include D3? That one does, yes. Okay. Uh, so that is one of the calciums I use. But because I use UVB, I only use the calcium with D3 a couple times a week. Most okay. of their feedings are without D3 or with a vitamin supplement. Um, so, so one interesting thing about the about calcium supplementation and Fantasticus that I've seen both in social media, speaking with other um, other uh, specialists, and also within our own collection, mm -hmm. is the uh, accumulation of calcium sacs in females. Now, um, I'd like to ask you about that, but but preface it with. So far from my personal experience, I've only seen the accumulation of calcium sacs in females that are not producing. Um, yep. it, does your experience uh, support that observation? Have you been able to uh, eliminate them once they happen? What, what is your experience? So my experience is the females that have overly large calcium sacs often don't produce very well. That's right. I, I don't know if it's because their bodies are not properly passing the calcium on to their eggs or if they're just I don't know, I feel like they were missing something in the processing of that calcium and that's why it's accumulating have instead you, of being used. Have you experienced young females develop the yes. calcium sacs? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, I've absolutely seen very young females, even from the time they're half grown, I'll start to see them. And when I do, I usually back off on the calcium. Absolutely, yeah. and that has had positive results. Yeah, and usually it levels itself out pretty quickly. Interesting. So, so we've we've been fortunate not to have a huge problem uh, with that. Now, with respect to saying it's a problem, just understand I haven't lost an animal Same. due to it. But, Same. But as you mentioned, they're not breeding. So in terms of the chicken or the egg here, I'm going to say that it's, I it, it agree with you, I think there's a reproductive issue going on, yeah. and that creates the uh, accumulation of the, or it facilitates yeah. the accumulation. Of yeah, the that's been my theory. So that's everything my experience has been is it's, indicative of something else that's going on that's not happening quite the way it should. Okay, so we are getting a little advanced with that topic. So um, let's let's back up then. We've spoken about uh, the the uh, your preference for a bioactive, which I completely agree with. A healthy, thriving substrate with a, a good fungal, bacteria, mm -hmm. microorganism mixture is yes. essential. At this point, it is, my opinion is that it is the the modern way of reptile keeping, especially for smaller organisms, 
and uh, it makes life so much easier. I've been really happy to see the hobby going more and more towards a more natural way of keeping them. Yeah. I think it's just beneficial for everything. Yeah, I, I mean, as a keeper, it makes your husbandry simpler. It does, much simpler. A lot of people don't expect that, but the better you set up your enclosure, the less maintenance you're really gonna have to do on it. Mm -hmm. It pretty well will take care of itself outside of you providing humidity, you know, moisture. Right. Right, food, moisture, uh, yeah. supplementation, exactly. So why don't we go then to, so we've spoken about temperature. Mm -hmm. I agree the best way to maintain temperature is to keep your room temperature within yeah. control and the UV lighting above your terrarium will be enough additional heat for yeah. the reptile. Absolutely. Um, we, we too use UV, we use a 5.0 bulb. Um, we also provide uh, LED light because we like a, a nice lush uh, plant growth. Yes. And you know, the more light, better, the better there. Uh, let's talk about humidity, which as, as you know from our discussions with uh, husbandry is different than, um, than rainfall uh, misting. Quite different, yes, yeah. quite different. So I'm lucky enough that in my basement, my humidity levels are pretty high. My relative humidity stays around 60 to 70% going up or down depending on the time of year, mm -hmm. how much heat or cooling I have to run. Mm -hmm. But aside from that, it, it really stays pretty stable, which has helped a lot in keeping the species and all Europlatus really. Okay. So let's let's pick a number uh, for you know if we're going to make a recommendation to you know interested keepers or people who are already keeping, uh, let's pick a number for day and nighttime humidity levels. My daytime humidity levels and what I prefer, I like to, them to be between sixty and seventy percent. Drops below that, I start getting a little concerned. Yep. And getting above that, you start to have issues with mold growth and things like that. That's mm -hmm. stuff you don't so want to you, deal with. So you like to maintain that day and night? Um, at nighttime, it does usually go up because I Naturally. won't have as much heat or air conditioning running. So it will go up to 75, but I really try not to let it get above 80 because okay. again, you start running into all the problems. Okay. So. Yeah, so in within, uh, as, uh, Within our reptile room, we, we shoot for 60 degrees during the day. We actually do uh, hit about 80, uh, I'm sorry, 60% right. during the day. <laughs> sorry about that one. Uh, at night, we do hit about 80%. Um, yeah. and, and we target that uh, because, as you know, we keep a lot of chameleons. Right. Um, so far, we've seen no adverse effects in the Fantasticus. We've had a pretty uh, solid breeding year. Um, but but I, the important thing is that we both agree that 60% number during the day is critical. Yep. And then why don't we close it off with uh, discussing um, rainfall, how often you are providing uh, water in the form of a mist during the day, and do you, do you mist before nighttime? So I mist every evening. Uh, okay. Because my relative humidity is so high, if I mist too often, and it, I end up with a sopping wet mess in the cages. Absolutely. So I just mist once in the evening, right before lights go out or right after they go out so that the geckos are becoming active mm -hmm. enough to go actually drink the water. Mm -hmm. uh, I still hand mist. It's one thing I hope to eventually change, but sure. it has helped me to fine tune what I need to do for hey, each there's, cage. There's no, uh, there, there's no discrediting the value of being able to actually sit there and interact with your animal one at a time. Um, if you're doing it during misting, at least you're doing it and uh, you can see the health, you can make sure the enclosure is the way it needs to be. Yeah. You can avoid oversaturating it, which you hinted on as well. Yeah, oversaturation can definitely be a problem mm -hmm. and it's, it's mostly just because it's so hard once it's oversaturated to back it off with the humidity requirements and rain requirements that they have. Yeah, it's have. not going to evaporate. No, exactly. so it just You're going to have to drain there. it. You yeah. do. It just sits there. Yeah. So um, let's, uh, let's close the husbandry discussion then on feeding. So I feed a variety of feeders to most of my animals. Uh, Fantasticus are no different, but my primary feeders for them are crickets sure. and dubia roach nymphs. So are you, have you found that the dubias are able to actually, like they don't just hide from the Fantasticus? Fantasticus tend to go absolutely bonkers over them no and kidding. will pull them out as soon as you put them in. I rarely have any left over after a feeding. Okay, so and this is news grab it to when, me because yeah, we do not feed dubia to Fantasticus. Yeah, I really like it. It seems to be really great, especially for keeping weight on breeding females. I really like the way that they, the body condition progresses on it, but they love them. They just really love them. It's, that's a fun treat for them. Mm -hmm. they, Mm -hmm. Always eat more on dubia nights. And if any of you guys don't already know, the beauty of dubia roaches is that with one colony, you can actually reproduce it and you can yep. be self-sustaining. Um, yep. Whereas crickets, it's much more difficult. 
it's definitely a lot more difficult, especially when you go through yeah. 200 animals worth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we buy our crickets. <laughs> same, yeah. same. But do be a roach colony, I, I keep. Well, I want to thank you for joining us today and uh, taking the time to talk with us about our favorite gecko. Yeah, anytime. Um, tomorrow we will resume the conversation and discuss the breeding of the species, which is a pretty uh, interesting topic to say the least. Very and interesting And we'll topic. talk about some colors as well. Guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Leap Learning. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and check us out on Instagram at leap.habitats. Thank you and we'll see you tomorrow. Hey guys, this is Tim Marks from Leap Habitats and welcome to another episode of Leap Learning. Today we are joined again by Christy Canarium of Christy's Reptile Room. And we have spoken the last two episodes about uh, the, the, how you got into Europlatus, uh, the basics of husbandry of Europlatus, but let's talk about something that people really wanna know, which is how do you breed Fantasticus? <laughs> Everyone wants to make more. <laughs> yes, yes. I, if you have two, you need four. If you have four, you need 20. Yeah, there's, there's uh, no limit. <laughs> it's a lot easier to breed them and reproduce them on your own than to go out and buy them. So let's, let's talk about this much enjoyed topic. So one of the things people ask me a lot is about breeding groups. For me, I really like to do just pairs, partly to keep my breeding lines diverse so I'm not having as many related offspring. Okay, so 1.1 so per Yep, 1.1 1. 1. 1 per cage. Okay. Um, I've also found that in trio, sometimes the male will pick a favorite female and never get around to breeding with the second female anyway. Well, that's not fair. She's being neglected, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I've just found that to be a much more workable ratio. Got um, it. Yep. I yep. do know people who have uh, individual females housed separately, but then will rotate a male between cages. But for me, I don't really enjoy doing that with them because they're a species that really doesn't enjoy being moved around a lot. They like consistency. They, they do, from our experience, mm -hmm. they do like consistency and they are very particular animals with respect to their consistency yes. to the point that uh, when we are acclimating new animals, whether they're captive bred or wild caught, if they were not a pair prior, we do not yeah. put them in the same enclosure for you know at least six weeks. We let them actually same. get used to their environment. I do the same, and I just find much better results doing that. You'll find you'll, they'll breed more readily also yep. if you're, they're less stressed and already acclimated. Yep. And, and as we mentioned in a previous episode, a problem with Fantascus is that when they are stressed, they don't show you they just they die. They do. They and don't. that's terrible. Yes. And we need to do everything we can to avoid that. Yes, agreed. Um, one of the interesting things, too, I've come across in Fantasticus is I still believe that it's likely we have a lot of subspecies we aren't aware of, whether it's location, where they were collected, where individual animals came from. But I'll find that one pair will never produce fertile eggs, even though I've witnessed breeding. I'll only get dud eggs out of them. But I switch up pairings and then it works out. So you've witnessed breeding, you're getting dud eggs, yep. and yet you you switch both animals and get results with both animals yep. with, a, with in a different pairing. Exactly. So Interesting, yeah. Um, the females, of course, leaf litter is incredibly important. That's okay. where they're gonna drop their eggs mm -hmm. when they do lay. Under the leaf litter yep. on the top of the soil. Yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, which luckily makes them fairly easy to find, which is, something I wish the rest of my geckos would learn. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, now I've heard a tip uh, that if you put the leaf litter only toward the front of the cage. I wonder uh, where you heard that tip from. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so so it, it, why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so since they're going to lay their eggs in the leaf litter, if you only put the leaf litter in the front of the cage, that's where they're gonna lay. It's gonna make it so much easier. Yeah. You do occasionally have a rogue female who would just be like, no, I'm." not having it and <laughs> we'll lay in the back uh, but it's uncut look i i've got i've got a story for you <laughs> on that one um kelsey one day sent me a text message because she had just found seven eggs <laughs> inside of a female's cage that we had thought hadn't laid it all that season uh in addition to the seven eggs she found a hatchling uh, yeah, I have found hatchlings a couple times in enclosures, and yeah. that's always a bit of a shock because I, I'm so careful about looking for eggs that it, I mean, it really we, is shocking. We love this animal. We, we 
care so much for this animal, the fact that you could miss an egg in a hatching, but it happens, they're good little hiders. They are, and, and it's not like they're in enormous enclosures either, so That's you right. would think that they would be fairly easy to find, but. Well, the eggs that Kelsey had found uh, were in the root ball of a plant, or right near the root ball of yep, a plant. Yep, I've also found them to like those kind of laying spots if they've decided your leaf litter is too exposed it, yeah, for them. Yeah, it's not good enough. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Um, so what kind of egg production do you see? Is it a monthly occurrence? Yeah, monthly um, usually ranges from three to four weeks between clutches. I have had females that will lay them every three weeks. I've had females that go about every four, but they'll lay two eggs at a time, uh, usually throughout the entire breeding season. And I mean, it's not uncommon to get five to eight clutches per pair. Seems, seems reasonable. Um, do all of your pairs produce the same uh, uh, number of eggs? Do you have some winners, oh, no. some losers? <laughs> oh no, yeah, there's definitely a great deal of variation between production. And a lot of it may have to do with the age of the animal or, you know, just stress level. If anything may have changed in their environment, they might stop laying altogether. Yeah. I have females that only lay single egg clutches. Uh, do you, that continuously only Continuously, lay. yes. Interesting. Yeah, I have some that have never laid anything but single egg clutches. So. Interesting. Um, do you have females that just simply don't seem cut out to lay anything? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I've definitely had females that just don't have any interest at all. Yeah. And we've had some experience with that too. They're, yeah. yeah, they're all different. Um, it is not the kind of gecko that if you want to get really into breeding, you do need to have a decent sized collection. Yeah, just you a pair or two. don't get consistent uh, results out of each animal. Yeah, exactly. Just a pair or two. And, and you'll find males sometimes that just seem to want to be roommates with their female and never get around to breeding. Yeah. yeah. I've had a couple that I ended up retiring just because they never never showed any interest. So you just separated them yeah. at that point? Yeah, I'm gonna try a different, different male with a female and just let him yeah. do his thing. Yeah, so um, uh, w one of the things that I find most adorable about Fantascus <laughs> is that, and maybe I'm anthropomorphizing here, and it's entirely possible that I am. Uh, in fact, it's quite logical that I am. But we have some pairs that seem like little lovebirds. And you put them in, once they have uh, been, been put in the same cage together, and they, you know, and we keep them that way, uh, they hang out next to each other all the time. Every day, right next to each other. Whereas other pairs, they don't. And both, both uh, uh, you know, in, in both examples, there are breeding. Have you seen that? I have. Yeah, it's definitely something I've seen. And I don't know if there's actually any form of pair bonding with the species. But I do find that when I have a pair that's super successful, I tend to leave them together anyway. So okay, yeah. I don't test it to see if there's any sort of problem with trying to pair them to anything else. Yeah, we do not either. Yeah. I mean, there's some interesting data to be had by that, but when we're really just going for the health and the, and the success of the organism, exactly. why, why mess with it? I'm not experimenting with it. I want them to be successful. Yeah, so. yeah, I agree. Um, and and going back to it about the topic of putting uh, one male and one female per cage, we do the same thing. And the reason why is because we're very particular about uh, monitoring our bloodlines. Yes. and producing the most genetic diversity that we can. We're fortunate that Madagascar is importing animals um, in the sense that there is uh, genetics that can be obtained from wild caught. But wild caught is, it's not an easy process and it's something that should definitely be left to experts. So we consider our collection to be of the absolute utmost importance and maintaining genetic diversity. You put one male with multiple females and it might have saved you the, the cost of an additional male, but you've got two uh, half-related organisms yep. now. I agree completely. Um, I track my bloodlines religiously. I want to make sure that I'm getting the best diversity out of it I can. And part of it is because there are so few, few people that are really consistently producing them yeah. that I don't want to dilute my own bloodlines when I could be supplying someone else's collection and, and them not know it and yes. you know down the road you're going to run into issues. Absolutely, absolutely and uh, and and Christy and, uh, and myself and Kelsey at the Leap Lab uh, we do trade organisms um, uh, from yep. time to time and we keep track of the bloodlines that we are getting yes. from one another because it's critical. I mean, we have to help one another, and if we're not monitoring what animals we're breeding, then you know we could it could be detrimental to your collection and vice versa. One thing I found 
with a lot of Europlatus breeders is that there's a sense of camaraderie with it, mm -hmm. and we really do try to support each other. Mm -hmm. I think that's so important. I think that a lot of other people that work with other species could learn a lot from that. Yeah. Everything benefits yeah. when you work together on a project like this. Yeah. They're rare and delicate and beautiful animals, and I want to set them up for the best possible success. And I feel that way, whether it's somebody who's just getting into them or working with somebody like yourself who has been working with them for a while, is familiar with them, and mm -hmm. you know. No, and we're always learning new things, and it's also equally as important to share the new knowledge. And mm -hmm. you know, maybe we did do an experiment, or maybe we accidentally determined something new that was either bad or good. I think it's very important that we share that information. Uh, let's talk about, so we've talked about the, the uh, breeding. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the incubation. Incubation is something that can be really tricky. Yeah. And what's even trickier about it is different things tend to work for different people. For myself, I actually have a little wine refrigerator that I use to keep the eggs at a cool enough temperature okay. and so that they don't fluctuate as hard as the room does. Because in the wild, of course, they're gonna be on the ground where the table, this, you know, the temperature is gonna be more stable. Yes. The ground changes temperature a lot less quickly than the air does. So an important thing with hard shelled eggs is you don't want them in contact with too much moisture. So my personal method that I've had the best success with is I will put the eggs in a container, or I'll have uh, incubation media in a container, which I will have damp media in, and then I use a smaller cup of dry media that the egg actually sits in. So mm -hmm. they get the humidity from the moisture, but without direct contact mm -hmm. with the wet. Mm -hmm. um, I keep mine, I, I like to incubate low. I find I get much stronger healthier hatchlings that way. So my incubation temperatures are typically not above 68, usually. Not above low. 68. Mm -hmm. And what uh, what um, time uh, for a hatch do you see? Depending on the time of year, if they hatch over winter when my temps are especially low, mm -hmm. I can they can go up to even 130 plus days. Um, but usually when the temperatures are more normal, I usually see around 100 to 110. About four months. Yeah. Yep. Yep, and we see the same thing incubating at uh, approximately 70 degrees, 72 degrees. Yeah, yeah pretty close. Um, and I think it is no surprise that we use the same incubation technique as you do. Uh, we use moist sphagnum moss in the bottom mm -hmm. of a cup with a deli cup above that, dry vermiculite and the eggs on top of that. Yeah. Um, uh, to our detriment, uh, we did not do that in the beginning. I, I ignorantly incubated them the same way I would incubate uh, chameleon eggs in moist vermiculite. And it yeah. worked for us for a little while, and then we had clutch after clutch not hatch. And, and that ended up hurts. <laughs> 10 eggs easily. Yeah. Uh, not hatch and that was a real slap in the face to yeah. uh, to our project and and you know just uh, it's sad I mean it's really sad how many yeah. animals that we we lost because of that um, but having switched and having gotten the eggs off the floor and into an incubator with more stable temperatures yeah. has produced uh, enormously positive results. Yeah, and I, I went through a similar thing. And you absolutely can incubate them directly on a moist media, but it has to be a very specific moisture level. If it's too wet, the eggs will not, yeah. they'll fail. Precisely, and yeah. that's, what, that's what we yeah. did. And it's just a much easier process to do it the other way. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Christy. I appreciate having you on the show. Um, the knowledge that Christy is sharing with us has been uh, has been uh, achieved by years and years of experience in the industry, and it is not easy to do this stuff quickly. So um, thank you for sharing it with us. Absolutely, it's very generous of you. Uh, next episode, we're going to talk about color morphs and some of our experience with uh, what happens when you breed uh, one color morph with another color morph. I think even referring to them as morphs at this time might be a little premature. Premature. <laughs> yep, yep, but uh, certainly there's a lot of diversity in the colors. Thanks very much for watching the show, guys. Uh, if you have not already, please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Instagram at leap.habitats. Thanks very much. We'll see you next time. Hey guys, this is Tim Marks from Leap Habitats, and today on another episode of Leap Learning, we have Christy Canerium from Christy's Reptile Room, and we'll be discussing our favorite topic of, of this, uh, what, four-part series. <laughs>
fantasticus, Europlatus fantasticus coloration. So, this... so we, we, yeah, we brought this up in, in the last episode where I referred to them as color morphs. But I think we both agree, we are not talking about color morphs in the traditional sense. What, what are we talking about here? So typically when you think of a morph, you think of genetic morphs, uh, dominant traits, co-dominant, okay. recessive. Yeah. But with Fantasticus, it's not quite like that. Um, they really have an incredible variety, and they mix very interestingly, which has mix. been really, really fun. So, yes. so when you say mix, you're referring to the offspring of yes. a couple of different uh, colors. Yeah, one of my favorite things has been to put completely different looking animals together to see what happens. And what I've discovered is they quite often, instead of the pattern becoming muddy or losing it, they'll kind of layer over each other. And not in all the offspring, you're gonna get a tremendous variety of, sure. of offspring. Sure. But there will be ones that the pattern just comes together and you'll see both parents represented in the offspring. Why don't we discuss what what are your, what is your perception of the different colors that you find in Fantascus? If you had to, you know, and we know there are shades of gray here, but mm -hmm. if you had to label uh, a handful of different color types, what would you say? So there's definitely red. You see red fairly often in them, which I thoroughly enjoy. So you by red, oranges. are you referring to the caramel color or the straight, uh, the rose color? Like the... it's more of a true red. If okay. you if you see some animals, I've seen some very genuinely true red animals. Incredible. Um, I'm lucky to have a couple of That's incredible. Those. <laughs> yes. um, you're gonna need to send pictures. <laughs> uh, and babies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but those are really fun. But you also see various oranges, browns, tans, I've seen on very rare occasion a couple of black ones. However, I've found typically even if a hatchling comes out black, it usually fades as it gets older. Yeah, down often to a babies gray. are darker. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So they usually turn like a gray or a tan a, color. A gray, older. interesting. Yeah. yeah, I do have a couple of, of gray animals that hatched out black. Hmm. So, hmm. yeah. So I mean, really, there's a ton of variation. You, you're not going to really see a true green, or obviously not blue, or anything like no. that. No. Yeah, I agree. It is. It is shades of brown. Yep. For the most part, uh, on the lighter side, we've got ones that are uh, very light tan. Very um, light. Uh, almost, uh, you know, the the smoke color of the wall behind us, yeah. um, or paler, and uh, and then it it goes up to yeah, like you said, dark. So in addition to the colors that we see. Mm -hmm. We also have some patterns that yes. either lay on top of the colors or are part of the coloration. So talk yes. to us about the patterns. So one of my absolute favorite, favorite patterns you see is leaf veining. And it's very much mimicking the veining of a leaf. And it can be just incredibly striking. And it'll typically be much lighter than the animal is, usually very, very light tan or even leaning towards white. White, yeah. Um, yeah. I've never seen super bright white, but yeah. close. Not, not in, you know, in a, a ciliaris way. Right, exactly. Yeah. So that's absolutely one of my favorite pattern types. And I found that one passes on extremely well to offspring. Absolutely. Which I was thrilled to discover because yeah. I love it so much. Oh, I'm in the same boat as you. <laughs> the veined ones are without a doubt my favorite. Yep. Yeah. Um, so then aside from that, you have a lot of lichen patternings where and I imagine this has a great deal to do with where the individual animal, what region they're from, you know, what the coloration around them is. I really wonder that. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, you know, I've only been to Madagascar once and we didn't have the, uh, we were not fortunate enough to find any Fantascus, but it will be a focus of future trips. I'm going to need pictures or to go with you. No, you're going to be on the trip. <laughs> yeah. So I, I really do find it interesting, and I, that's actually something I really love to learn more about. But you'll see lichen patterning on them. That, uh, again, there's a range. It ranges from super, super light in color to a very greenish tinged color, which can be really beautiful. So these are patches of yes, color, spots, these will be patches, irregular. Mm -hmm. And this varies widely in the size of the patches and where they are. Some. Uh, Typically, females do not express the patterns as strongly as the males do as far as lichen patterning goes. They'll have some spotting. And there's some usual typical areas you'll see, like underarm area. Yes. Very common. We all do, that's how you can often tell if they carry that gene. Yes. So yeah. that's really interesting. Um, so males show the lichen pattern more often yes. or stronger than the females. Yes. Veined is just as prevalent male and female. Yes. Um, and then I, I know of another one that we call blotched yes. uh, or blotchy. 
Um, why don't you talk to us about that? So the, there's actually a couple expressions of that particular gene. Some, sometimes you'll see a dark animal with like usually orange blotching yes. on him, which yes. is very, very attractive. And irregular? It's not that irregular. No. Usually okay. you can pretty much tell exactly where the blotching is gonna be when they pop out a blotched animal. They'll have a couple of spots on the back, usually like a saddle by the hips. Yes, but right mm -hmm. above the hips. Yeah, right above the hips, and then usually you'll see some, in, again, in the underarm area. So those are pretty consistent in where the patterning is. It can be bigger or smaller depending on the animal, but it's, pretty consistent in where you'll see I mean, it. This is, what, it, this is what makes me love this species so much, is that despite being just utterly beautiful on its own, this variety of coloration, and then when you start breeding these animals, to see the coloration that comes yes. out of the organisms you bred, uh, Kelsey produced some, I mean, the best I can, the best Thing I can use to describe them is they look like dragons. They're they've yes. got a vein, and you saw them earlier today <laughs> oh, and acknowledge yes. that these are some stunning animals. Uh, don't check my purse on the way out. <laughs> yeah, they've, they've got a vein down the back uh, that that is you know the edges come into the body, but along those edges are greens and reds, and yes. you know they're getting larger and the pattern beautiful. is staying. So we have no idea what it'll look like as an adult, but yeah. we're keeping our our fingers crossed now. So we've got we've got colorations, uh, browns, blacks, caramel colored um, is one of my favorites. Uh, 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 veins down the back, blotches, lichen. What happens when you breed those different colors together? Tell us your experience. So that's that's the fun part for me. Like I said, I love to put two animals that look completely different together. I took a beautiful red female and paired her to a very heavily lichen patterned male and ended up with the favorite animal in my collection currently. He is a bright red male covered in lichen patterning, wow. and he is stunning. He will stay with me always. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and hopefully we'll yeah. sire uh, a, a lot of He already has, yes, he already has. So rewarding. Yep, in so. fact, you have one of his offspring. Oh, so. is that our dark male? Yeah. The, the offspring of the dark male is the male. The, the one from today? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh goodness! Okay, got it. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, and going back to our conversation in the past episode about uh, keeping records, I mean, what more yes. reason do you need to keep records than the fact that the, you have these genetics? We don't yeah. know exactly the nature of the genetics, but they are definitely uh, expressed in in offspring. So yes. you know, knowing that, look, this this male. Uh, grandfather or whatever had this pattern and you know in in providing that animal to a new keeper and telling them that could be the difference between them per, you know creating another beautiful animal absolutely do you think that we could see the world of uh, of captive uh, fantasticus geckos going to a designer like market I could see it happening on one hand I always want people to prioritize line diversity and care of the animal over color production. Yeah, that is. However, a good that's point. part of what's great about these is because you can keep the line diversity while still introducing colors and patterns to your lines because they mix so well. Yes. So there's really no need to go into inbreeding with these animals because mm -hmm. you're going to get more interesting results if you don't. Yeah, and we've been able within our collection, mm -hmm. we've been able to produce incredible looking animals and and there's been absolutely no need or I mean, I don't know that there's ever a need to inbreed for whatever it's mm -hmm. worth, but but no desire to and it, it's had no effect on the quality of our organisms and from the sounds of the same is true with you. Yep, but uh, I think as we go forward, we're, we're gonna see more and more of these patterns coming together because again, we're taking animals from very different regions with very yes. different pattern types and we're gonna see all kinds of results from that. So I'm definitely interested to see where all of that goes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I just ho hope we don't lose the beauty of some of these uh, pure pure ones. I agree. Right now, so you know, I, I while muddying the water might be fun um, and, and stunning, uh, I think, you know, it's hard to, you, we just don't know enough. We you don't. Know, we don't know if the veined animals are coming from a particular region. We don't. And unfortunately, when a lot of the animals that are imported from Madagascar, they don't come with lineage information. No. So we have no idea. Or location. <laughs> Absolutely the, the not. The panther chameleons are coming in with locations because the market has requested it. Right. And the market's been heard uh, somehow um, uh, through collection, but I, it doesn't exist with the Europlatus no. whatsoever. 
uh, perhaps it's something that could. But I know for sure it's, it's going to be a topic of research for myself and something that we hope to experience firsthand on future expeditions into Madagascar. Yeah, and that's, that's something I'm really interested to see the result of because you just don't know at this point where things are coming from and if you are mixing locales, and, and chances are, I mean, I'm sure we are a lot. I'm sure we are, unfortunately. But how could we not without knowing? Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank you for uh, sharing all this information. I, I'd say that very few people in this country, uh, let alone in the world, can be, you know, have as much experience with Fantascus and with so many Fantascus as Christy Canarium. Um, so, you know, again, uh, thank you for on behalf of everyone. For, thank you for having me. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure for sure, and I look forward to having you again. Um, Guys, thanks for watching the show. Hope you liked it. Uh, don't forget, Leap Learning. We try to come up with as many episodes and about different things as often as we can. If you have ideas for future shows, don't uh, hesitate to comment in the comment section below. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And don't forget to also check us out on Instagram, where Kelsey has, uh, has the pleasure of sharing many, many, many photos, well, I should say the responsibility as well, of sharing many, many photos of beautiful Fantascus. And uh, check, check her photos out also at leap.kelsey on Instagram. Thanks very much, and we'll see you on another episode.